Welcome to another presentation from the CV Academics Foundation, home of the AMP Honors Program. Hi, AMP Honors Program. My name is Taylor. I'm one of your super mentors, and I'm here today with Lisa. She's a employee wellness program director, and she's going to tell us a little bit about what she does and her career path. So um, why don't we start with um, just describing what your career is and sort of a day in the life, um, if you can. So my current role is the employee, I, I uh, run the employee wellness program at Broward College, which is a wonderful community college in South Florida. So primarily during COVID, I have been doing a lot of uh, mental well-being. Um, I am my mindfulness meditation teacher. I teach yoga at LA Fitness. Um, and it's been more important to shift to a focus on what the employee population needs. And that's what we're finding in workplace health promotion is that we used to be really prescriptive about, well, here's our annual operating plan and here's what we're gonna do next September. And, and then, you know, September comes along and you're going, well, why did we think we should be doing that? And, and you feel bound to be uh, holding on to the, the strategy that you developed. So we're becoming a little bit less structured although we have an overarching annual plan. So we have almost 5,000 employees, full-time and part-time faculty and staff at Broward College. And it's gotten to the point now, which is really wonderful in a, in a career setting, is that they are coming to me saying, could you come into our department and do X, Y, and Z? So if you can get to that point, that is when it becomes really exciting because otherwise some of of you might know that workplace wellness tends to be about pushing down doors and justifying having a wellness program and getting senior leadership input and so on. And, and once you have that, it's incredible what you can accomplish. So um, a typical day these days uh, or, or, you know, kind of a day in the life is that um, I'm also involved in a lot of committees outside of my work uh, outside of my profession, which is to one's advantage because it helps you get to know people in a way other than just being the wellness coordinator, because otherwise you're going to be known as the fitness police or, or the, the food police, right? Somebody's eating a donut and they're going, oh, no, here she comes. So you have to be careful about that um, because that sets up a persona and then that's a barrier to communication. So we are navigating right now the process of returning faculty and staff and students back to campus. And so I coach with the Future of Work community that is developing that process. Um, I'm also on the Environmental Sustainability Committee, the Excellence in Academic Advising Committee. So a lot of that work is ongoing while I'm preparing presentations for both student and employers uh, this week or, um, and employees on stress management, on burnout, on mindfulness and meditation. And then um, I have a program. I love stretch bands, right? The tubing with handles, any, uh, the TheraBands, anything. And so I've developed a program um, called Minutes for Me. And it is 30 seconds of an exercise for each major muscle group using the band. And what I want people to do is to take a break, to do one exercise, take a sip of water, take a few breaths, and then get back to work. Look away from the monitor um, it, because it refreshes the mind and body. And so, so that's been a lot of fun because people think, well, in order to get fit, I have to do CrossFit, right? And so I have another program I'm starting called CouchFit. And so it is adapting exercises that you can do sitting on your couch, because the reality is, is that most people are not going to do those high intensity, long duration, really intense exercises that, that are stressful for them. Um, and so developing programs that work for people, beta testing them out on certain groups, and then getting feedback and then redefining them. So um, the, the 30 second band exercises and stretches have gone over really well. So that's, I work on incrementally, I work on all those things in any given part of the day. Um, I'm also in charge of the department's annual report this year. So I'm in HR, which is now called Talent and Culture. And uh, another colleague and I have been um, assigned to to monitor and, and compose the annual report. So when you're in workplace health promotion uh, as a wellness program leader in any capacity, you can decide to stay there and you or you can decide to be much more than that. And what that does when you branch out is it brings everything back to the program that expands your capability to do more. So, so that's, that's that. Oh, that sounds like quite a a lot that you that you are providing to the campus. Yeah. 
Um, I did have a question on the, the so the 30 second exercises that you do, um, do you recommend like after a certain amount of time someone's working to then do this or just whenever they start to feel kind of, um, I guess, drained or like they need a break? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, thanks for asking that. That's a good cl clarification question. Um, I also do ergonomic assessments. In ergonomics, we recommend, it's called the 30-30 rule. Every 30 minutes, take a 30 second break. Unless you're super focused, you know how it is when you're working on a project and you're really focused, but never, never sit for more than an hour at a time without getting up, getting some circulation going, doing some breaths. Because when we get stressed out, when we're focusing, we roll inward, we don't breathe as deeply, we take shallow breaths, we don't get enough oxygen into our body, so therefore we get tired and we're less able to focus. So no more than an hour, preferably 30 minutes. Yeah, that's good to know, I guess. I find that too when I'm, so on some days of the week, I'm really busy walking to campus and different classes, but on others, um, it's more online. I'm just sitting at my desk most of the day. And on those days, I find myself more kind of um, dragging, less motivated to mm -hmm. do my work. So, right. Yeah, that's right. interesting. Yeah. And then your brain says, I'd like some carbs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that uh, brings me to another question. Um, so the nutritional aspect, do you promote nutritional tips um, to employees as well? Yeah. And, and I'll share with you that um, everyone has their strengths, right? Nutrition is not mine. And so I was more into the fitness part, less into the nutritional part. So you have to have liaisons. Um, we work with our local medical center, they have dietitians, they have physicians that come in and do webinars for us. And, and so if we have, and we also have our employee assistance program that has registered dietitians that people can call. Workplace wellness programs should not do weight loss programs. And that's really important because that used to be a mainstay of workplace wellness. You know, you lose X pounds, you get points and all of that. Um, yeah, don't do it because it makes people feel worse than before because they lose the weight, they gain it back, they feel bad. Um, and so eating is another one of those emotional things. So people need to figure out why do I eat what I eat and what are my priorities? So I do provide tips, but it's only with, a, you know, I write a, a newsletter every week called Wellbeing Wednesday. So if I provide nutrition tips, I always include the link to the article where I got the tips. And so that way it's not Lisa says, it's here's what I got from the article. You want to learn more, read the article. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a good way to go about it. So your education um, to employees on wellness, does that consist of mostly presentations to the employees or do you do like individual meetings if they request it or how does that look? Um, both, yes, yes. Um, we do less of the, as I said before, um, workplace wellness programs used to be all point tracking challenges you know, one challenge to the next and, you know, you get done, you run up the steps and you get a t-shirt or something like that. And, and those are okay for the very small percentage of the population who enjoy them. You might have 200 people sign up and you'll have 20 completed. Um, and it gets tedious and people actually feel coerced if it's a team challenge. Um, so, so I try to stay away from those and they're okay, but let people, we have to let people know that um, if they're going to engage in something like that, you get tired of it, you, you can drop out and nobody should feel like they are required to. Um, so most of what I do is group oriented. So more, more of the population health approach. Um, if people want individuals, certainly I talk to individuals every day. I'm also in May for mental health month bringing in two licensed clinical counselors for 10 sessions, 10 half hour sessions with each of them to see if people would want individual counseling with a, with a therapist, just kind of getting rid of that stigma over, over mental health. And then also with our registered dietitians at our medical center, um, we'll be having individual sessions with them. So we do need to personalize it in addition to doing the group activities. So, um, so those are the options that we have right now. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Wellness and health is definitely an individual takes an individual approach. Mm -hmm. I did want to ask how you got interested in this profession or is there something um, certain that led you to this career path? 
Um, yeah, well, I've been around for a long time. So, so my career path back then is not the same as the career path now, because really when I started in workplace health promotion, it didn't really exist as a field. Um, a lot of us were, I was a fitness instructor and I still teach, but not as much. But um, we started talking about what our stressors were and people were saying, well, they weren't getting enough sleep. So I worked at a resort at the time and somebody at the resort said, well, why don't we have Lisa come over and do a stretch break? And after the stretch break, people were saying, well, you know, what should I be doing in the morning? And, and it really ended up being a series of presentations, workshops, interactive activities with groups that started out way back, way back when. Um, not knowing from my side that that was a microcosm of what was going on all over the country. And eventually, and, and there were certainly some structured programs before it, before that, but not as much. And so eventually people began writing about it and, and we began learning more, forming collective uh, groups like Wellness Councils um, of America and the National Wellness Institute and so on, formalized bodies of, of knowledge acquisition and dissemination. Um, so, so right now, if someone wanted to explore workplace health promotion, the first thing that you would want to do is read on the, on the current literature um, from, say, WellCOA or National Wellness Institute, um, get connected with people on LinkedIn and join groups that, that you can just kind of sit there and learn from because it's much different now. You almost have to go into an organization at this point and maybe you start to roll with what's there, but then completely recreate it. Because this is the time now when organizations are open to doing that. Yeah, that's really interesting. I had another question when you were talking about leading to this career, if someone was interested, I guess what kind of education would a student need, say if they wanted to have your career? You could go into this profession with a bachelor's degree and, and there are some really good degree programs Programs now. In fact, the University of Wisconsin has the health and wellness major. It's an online degree program. They have a bachelor's and a master's, and they are one of the few that are addressing what is germane now to what we need to know. If you want to get into this profession and you don't have a degree in it, you should at least have a degree in some type of health science that will give you that underlying foundation of health behaviors and so on. There are also then certifications that people could take through the National Wellness Institute. The Wellness Councils of America are probably the two best known. Um, and then you would wanna get into a role where you are not in a leadership role. You wanna get into a learning role um, because that's always a good place to start. So if you have the opportunity to learn from someone who's been around for a longer time, um, that's to your advantage. Another uh, way to get into health promotion in the workplace is to look up wellness vendors. There are varying degrees of, they're all pretty much the same. They offer an online health assessment, um, populating with the biometric screenings. You can do health challenges through there. You can have, there's called, it's called the digital health, digital health assistant, where people can say choose stress and they will put themselves on this 30 day program where they get a prompt. They can choose to get a text. They can go into the web portal. They can connect with other people. They can download um, uh, mindfulness programs. So, so go in and, and check those out. Just type in, go and do a search for um, um, health and wellness vendors, workplace wellness vendors, something like that. And then you can go onto their job site, look at what the jobs are that are open, and then look at what the requirements are for the job because that will tell you a lot of, of what they're looking, organizations are, are looking for and what you will be doing on a particular job. Once you write, get out of college, you wanna go right into your dream career, um, but that learning from someone whose experience is definitely very mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's one thing, you know, we always learn well from our own mistakes, but sometimes we can learn from this other people's mistakes too. The challenge though in health promotion is, um, you lose credibility and it's really hard to get it back. Really hard to get it back. So you've got to start out. You have to go in with this profession. You have to go in being overly professional, if you know what I mean, because they want to dismiss you as a little wellness girl or, or guy. Then that's just the nature of, of the work. And so you have to establish yourself as really being someone who is there for them, not to tell them what to do um, for any particular life stage. That's a really good point, um, not telling them what to do and just kind of, would you describe it as more of being a listener? Um, 
too? Well, there's a lot of coaching and, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up because coaching is another way to go. Um, wellness coaching is different from life coaching is different from personal training, although you could do them all in, in any kind of um, context. But um, ACE, the American Council on Exercise, has a um, wellness coach program. And it's more fitness oriented. It's more fitness oriented, but it also gives people a foundation of what coaching is like, um, what some of the ways that you, you coach people to help them solve their own problems based on what their own life entails. So um, in addition to vendors, check out the health coaching organizations. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask you another question about your career. So um, what would you describe as being um, maybe the most rewarding aspect and with that maybe the most challenging or um, hardest aspect of it? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what was one of the most rewarding things that's ever happened in my career just happened during COVID. The president of our college was giving the opening address for one of our town hall meetings that we have on Fridays. Um, at which between like six and 900 employees attend. And he personally thanked me for the work that I have been doing during COVID to keep people healthy. It's like, okay, that's all I need for the rest of this week and month because when does that happen? And when does someone at, at that level of an organization take the time to say that? Just this week from my Wellbeing Wednesday newsletter, the senior vice president sent me a really nice message saying, wow, thank you so much for everything that you're doing for us. That is the career highlight. Um, and, you know, we know that when people appreciate our work and they articulate that and they tell us that it's rewarding, um, but to have it be said um, on, on a video that goes out to all of our employees and beyond um, was really exceptional. And so, um, you know, I still, that makes you want to work harder, of course. It makes you want to do even more and, and work to help make people's lives better to even an even greater degree. Um, so the biggest challenge is always, um, and I don't wanna say getting people to change, but helping people develop a priority on their health to the point where they don't keep blowing it off. Everybody wants to be healthy, everybody wants to be fit, but not everybody wants to do the things that help you be healthy and fit, right? And, oh, well, I'm too tired. Well, oh, they'll say, I don't enjoy exercise. I'll say, well, it, but, but they know that physical activity is good for your health. And I'll say, well, do you really enjoy brushing your teeth? And they're going, why are you asking me that? No, it's just something that I do. Well, why do you do it? Well, I wanna have healthy teeth. And also, you know, we know that dental issues contribute to heart disease and all that. Well, okay, so you don't enjoy brushing your teeth, but you do it twice a day. You don't enjoy exercise, but you know that it helps you. So let's talk about this. They're going, oh yeah, no, I get it. So that's where that incremental activity comes in. So, so it's, always, it's always chipping at the resistance and keeping people motivated, but knowing that you may not be seeing progress at the moment, mm -hmm. but it's that accumulated activity over time that's gonna get you the benefit. And, and so that is the ongoing challenge in, in my work um, is to, Help, help people develop that as a mindset, as a priority, and then as the lifestyle. So the president of your college had thanked you for what you've done during COVID. Was there anything specific that you focused on more during COVID than you had previously or how you mm -hmm. changed your approach during COVID? Yes, there is. Um, it was all about helping people stay grounded. Um, and not because anxiety gets a hold of people's brains and then it gets a hold of itself and it just rolls. Um, so I focus a lot, and this is my, my newest passion in the last year or two, is um, neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience and the concept of neuroplasticity, helping people understand that it's not because you're lazy or you don't have willpower, you don't have discipline. It's how you are repeating things to yourself over time in your mind. And so that helps to calm down. We do a lot, a lot of um, stress management and, and um, some cognitive behavioral therapy approaches like the stop practice. That is really useful in, you find yourself getting angry, you stop, you take a couple of breaths, you explore, okay, what am I feeling? Am I really, am I angry? Am I 
frustrated? Am I, do I feel disrespected? Am I impatient? Am I just tired? Am I hungry? What's going on? Why do I feel like this? And then you decide based on what I just thought about, how do I proceed? And over time, as you calm yourself down, you learn to have better responses rather than reactions. You make stronger neuronal connections between the parts of your brain that say, oh yeah, I know how to do this. Now I can calm myself down. It's really, really valuable. So that's something that I focus on. Um, I have a Tuesday um, purposeful pauses practice that people can just come on teams with us and we do stuff. We stretch, we, it's 15 minutes, we breathe, um, we talk about some things and we laugh and, and it just gets people to step away because there's a lot of depression and then people think they're clinically depressed, but it's situational depression. So, so that's one of the things that I've been focusing on a lot. Okay, you consider that um, self-care um, that you've been yeah. emphasizing yeah. too? Okay. Mm -hmm. more, so, more so than ever. More so. And, and also um, along with self-care is, we know that other people affect our life, right? And the way that we feel about our lives, they affect our behaviors. So, um, you know, it's always says you are the sum of the five people that you hang around with most. And so we're talking also about in your departments, in your work groups, how are you showing up for other people? You know, we're not asking anybody to be one another's therapist, but do you come in and are you always down? Are you always complaining? Are you never part of the solution? Are you... Um, lifting people up? Are you complimenting them? Are you acknowledging the work that they're doing? Or are you competitive? Right? You know, it, th those are the kinds of things that we need to help people understand that that will probably influence your mental health to a greater degree than many things in the workplace. And so it's not only in self-care, but it's, it's collective care. Care for self, care for one another, um, and then care for the entire group. Yeah, I like that, um, influencing others too and how that affects yourself. Um, do you have yeah. a favorite like self-care action or activity that either you like doing or you like recommending? I like the stop practice a lot. I also encourage people to start meetings with an opening, um, you know, an inspirational quote or something like that. Um, because that way everybody gets into the zone and they focus on what can, what's positive. Self-doubt is probably the biggest contributor to lack of success, I think. Um, and then for my own self-care, um, I have, my living room usually looks like a circuit. Um, and so I have it set up so that I can do a four minute circuit. So I have my mini trampoline, my step, my BOSU, my medicine ball, my bands and a set of weights and a mat. So when I need to step away, I just go around my living room and do a circuit to, to Bad Bunny. And, um, and I know it sounds really silly, but you come back and you go, oh, now I'm energized again. So I think those incremental bits of energizers throughout the day are probably be better than a whole you know, super one hour workout at the end of a day. Yeah, I like that. That sounds really fun. And, and people will say, you know, what you always look so energetic, where do you get your energy from? And that's an opportunity to say, you know, no extreme behaviors. And this is what I do it might work for you might not, but it's worth a try because it won't hurt. Yeah. Um, that extreme behaviors, do you mean um, like maybe crash dieting or? Um, yes. Yeah, okay. crash dieting and dieting that that leave diets that leave out a major food group, mm -hmm. and then also physical activity that um, can create injuries in the long run. Okay, because there is no need to do excessively high intensity exercise. Um, the research is showing that it's okay to do it now and then, um, mm -hmm. but it's detrimental over time. Okay. Yeah, that's um, some really good advice. Like the small things add up like those 15 minute breaks or oh yeah um, uh, 30 seconds every 30 minutes I really like that mm -hmm. do you have any um, anything else that you would like to add or share with the students on AMP HP career wise um, it's it's important to look at all of the literature that's out there just look on the web and see what's out there because um like I said, it's really changing. And there are still many old points for prizes type of program. 
Um, also learn about the ACA and the EEOC wellness rules, which are right now we don't, we have the old rules, but they're going to be changing them. Just learn about that kind of stuff. So you get some flavor of, of what we're, what we're dealing with and then um, talk to people, you know, find out who has a wellness program, go talk to people and see if it's something you'd be interested in. Um, I can tell you that it's um, a lot of frustration, a lot of frustration because um, people, like I said, they want to be healthy. They just don't want to do this stuff. And then you're, you're, you have to provide reports. Well, it's like, why were there only X number of people in here? You know, you must not be doing your job. And so you have to guard against that by having a really strong understanding when you come into the position of what is being asked of you in terms of metrics and reporting. Um, do they have any requirements? Because that could be detrimental. Because oftentimes people who are setting those standards don't really understand the profession either and, and what wellness can do. So, you know, wellness is not all about diet and exercise. It really does run the gamut of, of the domains of environmental. And now we have all the social conditions with diversity, equity, and inclusion. But personally, I would say for, for people who are wanting to go into any health profession, um, this is the time to really believe in yourself and get to know yourself. Like, what is the thing that really excites me? Like right now it's, it's neuroscience and we all should learn about that. But some people have a focus on nutrition. Some people wanna go into rehab areas. Um, and some people like the, the HR side of it where you, you do all kinds of other employee relations. So it really is getting to learn it, getting to know yourself, finding out what really excites you. Um, and then believing that you have the ability to do it. So explore internships and, um, or even, you know, short-term assignments so that you can go work with someone because we all benefit from working with one another. You have to find out what your strengths are and magnify those because um, you only get to be successful if you believe in yourself. Um, there's just no other way. And even if people don't believe in you, you know, I come from a family where no one went to college. It's like, get out of high school, get a, get a job. And so you have to find people who are like the way that you want to be and you then you help each other. Um, so and it, it sounds really simple, but it's a process every day. Those daily inspirational things, pull one up every morning, have a mantra. I know this is, sounds really silly. You know, people think of mantras where people are going home, where they're sitting on a cushion, burning incense, beads in the doorway, wearing a tie dye t-shirt, because that is the persona of a meditator, right? Whenever you see meditation, you always see somebody sitting cross-legged with their hands in a mudra. And, and then people think, well, I can't sit like that. I'm not comfortable. So you have to get away from what are the stereotypes of a, of a profession. Meditation is nothing more than the practice that enables you to focus and think clearly and get to know each other, calm your mind down. It doesn't matter where you are and where you do it, but you have to do something consistently to keep yourself level on track. And what I meant about a mantra is what kind of sayings do you have to, that gets yourself back on track? My mantra is I am here to make the world a better place. And so if there's somebody who is getting on my case or somebody who's negative, I'm saying, I am here to be a positive presence. I don't have to, you know, it's things that take you out of the negativity that the world will threaten to bring you down to. Because that's why our, our brains default to the negative. It's just a protective mechanism. So we have to override that that every day. Um, but yeah, I mean, going into a new profession, um, it's a really exciting time. And you have to admit when you don't know things and then find people who do know it and say, okay, this is not my strength, but it's your strength. So let's work together. And that's how you get collectively successful. Oh, well, thank you for that. That was some really great advice. I really appreciate you yeah. taking time to talk to us and um, share all that with us. So thank you for that. This has been a presentation of the CV Academics Foundation, home of the Amp Honors Program.